Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise, praise, praise the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. I just want to be sure that people can connect. So let me just wait for a minute or two. Amen. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, I can see some people joining in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. First of all, I will apologize. We had issues trying to connect with our YouTube channel. If you can hear me, just um, say something on the chat so that we know that you can hear. Amen. Praise the Lord. If my voice is clear, can I just uh, just make a comment so that we are sure that you can hear me clearly? I was I've been here for almost one hour battling how to connect on YouTube, and I couldn't uh, get it working because I didn't have the key. Praise the Lord! We give you all the glory. Hallelujah! Thank you very much, uh, uh, Yusuf. Motorayo, thank you for making me understand that you can hear me. Good. So we'll start and we believe that others will join us. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. Amen. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory we give you honor father we just want to thank you we bless your name we give you praise we give you glory for all that you are to us our savior our redeemer the captain of our salvation we thank you for your love that's everlasting concerning us thank you for the greatness that you have put inside of us thank you O oh god for this season of our house fellowship week for the year 2024 with the theme at thy word lord we thank you for how you started with us yesterday as we continue even throughout this week we give uh, we have expectations that your grace will abound towards us your mercy will locate us you will bless us you will cause your word to function in our lives we we'll begin to have new experiences new um, exposures and we will enjoy the wonders of your power in the mighty name of Jesus and so shall it be in Jesus mighty name today as we move to day two in this week of our house fellowship um, year, for the year 2024 I'm been given a topic to speak to you on on courtship and marriage courtship and marriage Amen. And I'm going to try to be very quick. It's something that we can spend two hours to talk about, you know, because when it comes to courtship, when it comes to marriage, it's something that everyone is interested in. Both those of us who are already married, you know, they tell us that when you get married is an institution that you cannot graduate from until you die. So it's like a lifelong um, um, institution. Then those who are looking to get married, they are very interested because relationship is one of the key things that determines one's destiny and how one's future is going to be formed. So it's a very, very serious topic, but I'm, I'm, you know, and it's so wide, but I'm going to compress it and see how we can finish within 40 minutes because of, uh, because we're online so we can save our data. So I'm just going to go straight into it. I'm going to talk about courtship first because, of course, there should be courtship before you go into marriage. Then as we are um, moving along, um, I'm going to be trying to be looking at the charts. Probably there are questions uh, people have. I will try and answer them straight away. So that's how we're going to move tonight. 
and please let us uh, share the link to those who might be waiting for us on youtube and they couldn't we couldn't get into youtube is asking for a key and you know we are all scattered i'm in the uk somebody's in a gumball somebody's on the road so there's too much disconnection so i just opted let's go to facebook facebook will be easier you know so that's why we moved it to facebook and i apologize once again praise the name of the lord now we're talking about marriage and courtship or sorry courtship and marriage and i'm going to everything i'm going to tell you is according to the redeemed christian church of god because you see this issue of courtship and marriage a lot of ministries they have different doctrines but thank god of uh, for our, our mission the redeemed christian church of god we focus everything on the word of god you know we take our doctrine we take our insight we take our principles we take our regulations from the holy bible from the scripture and the theme for this year's house fellowship week is at the word so in fact practically speaking everything that we should be doing throughout this week and indeed forever it should be biblical it should be it should have references to the bible so i'm confident i'm secured i'm assured that using the redeemed christian church of god template for courtship and marriage will not go wrong so now what is courtship let me start from there courtship amen uh the the rccg as a global pentecostal church holds strong biblical views on courtship and marriage and these teachings emphasize holiness it emphasizes commitment and the will of god in the formation and sustaining of marriage so there are three legs on which we're going to stand on tonight one is holiness number two commitment and number three um the will of god so those three things is, is going to drive everything i'm going to be speaking on tonight so everything is based on biblical principles now what is courtship courtship is seen as a period before marriage amen where a man underline those words where a man and a woman because you see the world we live in today man is marrying man and it is recognized constitutionally so whether we are saying oh those people will they don't like it you don't like it's happening it's happening and slowly it is moving to the world the whole of the western world right now they acknowledge a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a woman but we we are concentrating on a man marrying a woman amen now courtship is that period before marriage where a man and a woman led by god on the line of that word led by god get in touch with each other amen to better uh, to be to know themselves and in the process of knowing themselves they maintain purity in preparation for marriage so i'm going to try and break it down to simple bits so marriage uh, sorry courtship is that period where a man and a woman they come together to know themselves okay to understand themselves but in preparation to marriage and in this preparation they do it in purity you see when the bible tells us that a man knows a woman it, what they're implying is that you can have intimacy with that woman that's when the bible tells us and abraham knew his wife and uh, that knew his husband you know it talks about intimacy sexual intercourse takes place but when we are talking about courtship the knowing here is towards compatibility preparation towards marriage and that's why that word purity comes in place so that the bed is undefiled it differs from secular dating as it focuses on spiritual and emotional readiness with marriage as the end goal so there are a lot of people today that they say they are in courtship and they are dating each other you know they've done a lot of things they have kissed each other they have had sex with each other they've done a lot of you know in fact 
the everything that you see in marriage, they have done it already. And they tell you, oh, uh, Pastor, we are just, uh, uh, we are in courtship. Okay? Now, when you are talking about courtship, courtship has one end goal. And that end goal is preparation for marriage. So if anyone is in courtship and the marriage is not the end goal, then it's a different thing. So when we talk about courtship, we are talking about preparing towards marriage. And what, that's number one. Number two, it must be done in purity. Okay? And it focuses on spiritual and emotional readiness. So because of these things we're talking about, one, preparing towards marriage. Two, it must be done where it's more focused on spiritual and emotional readiness. So the two people are getting ready for marriage. They are going to live together forever. So spiritually, they want to be ready. Emotionally, you know, they want to be ready. So you want to know that, look, I can cope with this man. I can cope with this woman. We are compatible. We can live together. Okay. Then the third thing is that it must end up in marriage. Because of these three things, we now tell you that it is wise for courtship not to extend a period of two years. In fact, two years for me is even too long. At the maximum, let it be one year. Because if it's too long, then you will begin to see too many. Because you see, the marriage on its own is something that you're going to be learning about each other forever. So you cannot know a person forever. You cannot know the nitty gritty. And by the way, human beings will change. The way I was 20 years ago is not the same me today. When I was younger, I had different goals. I had different vision. My temperament was different. My outlook was different. My desires was different. But now, 30 years after, I have a different vision. I'm pursuing a different goal. My temperament has changed. My focus, even if my vision is still the same, the way I'm going about my vision has changed. So a human being is constantly changing. A human being. If, if uh, the people who are married on the call, if you ask them, they will tell you. A human being is constantly changing. As we are going older, we are maturing. We have different perspectives. We have different ideas. We have different ways that we react to issues because we change. So courtship should not be more than two years. Ideally, it should not be less than six months and should not be more than two years. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now, the principles of courtship. Number one, prayer and divine leading. Amen. We encourage that individuals will see God's will through prayer before entering to courtship. And the belief is that God must guide you in making the choice of a life partner. You cannot make the choice of a life partner on just flimsy things. For example, he is tall or he has a car or she is beautiful. Or have you seen she's very, she has very nice figure. Or she has lovely legs. She is, she, her father is very wealthy. You know, or is the only son and the father is wealthy. Those are not conditions. Those are fleshy desires that people look at. But when you, you make your choice and you, you choose a life partner, Based on God helping you to guide you, you will make the best. Because you see, what is going to happen tomorrow, it might not be showing today. Amen? Let's take, for example, let's look at someone like Daddy Joe, for example. Amen? By the time, the, the, when the Mommy Joe was, they were agreeing to marry, there was no idea that it was going to be a general overseer. Because he didn't know then. It was just somebody who was able to go to school. He broke the barriers of getting quality education. He became a very sought after a lecturer in a university, teaching math. He had a lot of prospects. But the prospect then was nowhere compared to what he's going to be now. Now, can you imagine if everybody knew that Pastor Adeboye, or let me say Professor Adeboye, then, or let's say doctor, because he was a doctor, PhD holder. Let's say Dr. Adeboye. If everybody knew that it would become a general overseer and with all this influence, with all this impartation, with all this wealth, do you, every girl would have been saying yes. In fact, they will fight themselves 
to marry him. But nobody knew. Amen? When you let God choose for you, God knows tomorrow. You don't know it. So you might be choosing somebody today that does not have a car. But tomorrow, that person is going to have a fleet of cars. The one that has a car today might end up trekking tomorrow. You don't know. So you cannot choose by yourself. That's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. So the, the scripture to hold on to in courtship, when you want to you know, choose a life partner, is to let God direct your path. Number two principle of courtship is that there must be purity and abstinence. Now, purity and abstinence from what? Sexual purity is emphasized during courtship. Amen? You must abstain from every form of sexual immorality or sexual conduct. There must not be any form of sexual uh, contact during courtship. That is what we try to propagate. And the reason being that once you bring in sexual, uh, sexual intercourse, it now becomes a sin because the Bible tells us that sexual immorality, we should flee all um, 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 appearance of sexual immorality. So until you get married, when I go to marriage now, I will talk about that issue in a larger um, um, scale. So we must avoid it. So when we talk about on that principle of courtship is purity and abstinence. Just wait. It's coming. Yeah, I know. It's your body's hot. It's, it's pushing. Yes, we agree. But just wait. Just wait a little more. You are going to get there. Don't rush. Say, oh, after all, she's going to be my wife. After all, she's going to be my husband. Or the world will tell you, let, you need to test it. Don't test it. Oh. You have to wait. Because when you test it, you are opening the door for the devil. You see, the devil is not, you know, we joke too much with the devil. The devil does not joke. You see what he did to Eve. The moment Eve began to discuss with Satan, she was gone already. Because Satan is worldly clever, is intelligent, is subtle, is full of tricks, is full of deceit. And everything he will do, he will still kill and destroy. And when you open the door to sexual immorality, the thing that you would have enjoyed in the confines of marriage, if you open that door before the time, you introduce Satan. That's the reason. You introduce Satan. When Satan comes in, he is going to commit havoc. A lot of marriages today did not last. Things happened because of sexual immorality. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now, another principle that I will talk on quickly is accountability. Accountability. Courtship is often conducted under the guardians. And this is where I want to speak, you know, with a lot of emphasis. It is conducted under the guardians of spiritual leaders, family, and the church. And why do we do so? To ensure both individuals are focused on godly relationship. You see, if you don't put accountability in your courtship, before you know it, you will fall into trials and temptation and you will, fall, you will destroy it. Because the destruction that comes in courtship is sexual immorality. Once sexual immorality comes in, the whole concept of courtship has collapsed. It has collapsed because there is no more a spiritual exercise. It now becomes like worldly dating. You know, you the, all the thing is, is finished. So you have to submit yourself to accountability. A lot of people, they will just come from Jericho and say, Pastor, I'm going to get married in two months' time. This is the girl I want to get married to. She's from so so church. Um, I want to do counseling. You know, they don't submit themselves to accountability. So you don't even know. Then if you say, no, you're not going to do this. Then it will be on that issue. Oh, this church is too difficult. We don't want, they don't want us to get married. We don't even understand what they are doing in this church. Then they will move to other churches and go and get married. Sometimes they come back. Sometimes you don't see them again. But the truth is that all this is what is creating problems today. There's a lot of marriages that have problems. And when you trace the problem, it starts from 
courtship where they fail to submit themselves to accountability. You must submit yourself. You must let your spiritual leaders know what you are doing. Your family must know what you are doing. Don't, you are not too intelligent. Just follow the principle. After all, it's for a short while. Once you get married, nobody's going to question you. Nobody's going to interfere. Nobody's going to, they're going to, they're going to leave you to enjoy your wife and enjoy your husband. But at the moment of courtship, submit yourself. Let people know what you are doing. Be accountable. Be accountable. Amen? Be accountable. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. And the next principle, I think we, are, we have done three or four now. Maybe I will just do one more so that we can move because I'm trying to, you know, compress everything as, as, as a short a time that we can. Then the next thing is clarity of intent. When we are talking about courtship, amen, especially for the sisters, in fact, the brothers too, there must be clarity of intent. Clarity of intent is clear intention of marriage. It's not, it's not something, that's why people tell us or they tell us that marriage is not for boys or girls, it's for mature people. When you are going, if you say you are in courtship, there must be clarity of intent. I want to get married. Now, if I want to get married, if there's clarity, I'm going to get married in so, so, so months. Let's say we are in October now. I want to get married in June of 2025. So there's clarity. There's no ambiguity of saying, well, well, let's just be seeing how God will lead us, you know, or you are in courtship with a girl and your eye is in somebody else, or you are in courtship with a guy and you are still playing, oh God, is this other guy that I'm really interested in, you know? But because my age, I'm already 20 something, you know, I'm a bit worried. My mommy is asking me questions. The way people are looking at me when I pass, they're making, mm -hmm. so let me just be following this guy first. You know, let's see how it be. Or you are doing uh, tubu tubu. Say, uh, let's pay one from two. If I throw this uh, newspaper now, it fall inside the bin. Then it's for it's for Michael. If uh, if uh, I throw it, it falls inside this one. Then it's for Matthew. No, 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 no. That's not courtship. Courtship is with clear intent. You must, you must, you must, you must, 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 must. You must know what you are doing. You must be intentional. You must be focused. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter six, uh, Second Corinthians, sorry, chapter six, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You must be committed to what you are doing and stay focused with clarity of intent. So that is the foundation of courtship. It's all about preparation to marriage. It's all about doing it with the word of God at the back of your heart. It's all about accountability. It's all about clarity of intent. It's all about purity and abstinence before marriage. And it's all about prayer and divine guidance for God to lead you. And it's all about knowing who you are going to get married to. One thing I will say before we move into the next phase, which is marriage, is that the, in courtship, you can break it up. In other words, you can call it up and say, look, I have checked this man, I have checked this woman, and it looks like we are not compatible. I don't like him, I don't like her. I cannot marry her. My vision is different from his vision. My vision is different from her vision. What she wants is not what I want. What she wants is not what I want. So there is, it is okay to break up courtship. And you see, when we are in courtship, that is the time we submit ourselves for counseling. You don't do counseling after you've gotten married because in courtship is a time of preparation towards marriage. So that's when you submit yourself for counseling. You bring yourself to the, the, um, um, you come under authority of your spiritual leadership so that they will show you biblical principles of the expectations of marriage. That's why you do courtship. In that process, you can say, look, I have looked at everything and I don't think this guy or this lady, I can go on with him or her. And you can call it off. There is no problem with that. It's absolutely okay. In fact, I've counseled people before that have told me that they don't want to continue. And I prayed for them and they separated and it's okay. So you must not say, oh, 
because I'm in courtship with this person, then I must know. Courtship is a time to know each other. That's why you must avoid every form of sexual intimacy. Because at the more in the courtship, you can end up in marriage, or you can say, No, we're not compatible, and you're allowed to call it off. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now we're going to go into marriage. Amen. Because it's courtship and marriage. Now, after a successful courtship, the, it now transits into marriage. Amen. So we're going to look at the foundation of marriage. There's a few things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be very brief and just touch on it because, you know, this topic is something that you can't even finish it in a year. It's, it's continuous. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Foundation of marriage. Now, the redeemed Christian church of God upholds that marriage is a divine institution ordained by God from the very beginning of creation. It is seen as a covenant, not just a contract. Because you see, when we look at legal proceedings, you see, when we get married, there's also the, the legal aspect of it, where you have local governments or you have courts that, you know, adjudicate on marriage and they make it a legal document. That is the contractual part of it. It's not just contractual. It's more, far, far more than that because we look at it as a covenant. And if you understand covenant, when it comes to biblical things, covenant cannot be broken. Amen? Covenant is something that is binding forever. So that's why we look at marriage as a lifetime institution because we see it as a covenant and not just a contract. And it is based on love, mutual respect, and partnership. So three things again that we're going to look at. It's based on love, mutual respect, and partnership. And we'll explain as we go on. So marriage in, in the redeemed Christian church of God is regarded as a lifelong union between a man and a woman. Emphasis again, man and a woman. With the aim of companionship, procreation, and fulfilling God's purpose for the couple. So you see, it's very complicated. With this introduction alone, you can, you can see that it will take ages to finish it. But I'm just going to run through, you know, touching things as we go. So we're looking at love, mutual respect, and partnership. Now, when you come together, you come together for companionship. You come together for procreation. That means, you know, it is allowed that you give birth, you, you know, give, bring children into the world and also train those children. Amen. And also fulfilling God's purpose. You see, marriage is something that if you get it wrong, that fulfilling God's purpose, that area, it now, it might become a mirage. A lot of people, their destinies have been truncated because of the errors or the issues or the challenges that they face in marriage. Once the home is not settled, it is difficult for every other thing to be settled. It's very difficult. A, family, a man or a woman that the home is on one leg, is difficult for that person to excel in many other areas. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Genesis 2, 24, there is, a, he says that a man will leave his father and mother and join and cleave and be together. Amen? Together with the wife. And they become one flesh. In other words, there is an entanglement that it gets entangled together and it becomes one. It now becomes difficult to separate. That is the real thing about marriage. So you see, people that are really married and they are following biblical principles, you begin to find out that the man and the woman begin to think alike. When you go to the wife behind the husband and you ask something, they speak the same way. Even sometimes, we, at least we've seen it, that when they start getting older, they begin to look alike facially because there's an entanglement. They become one, one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31. Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father 
a mother and be united with his wife, and two will become one flesh. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So marriage as a covenant. Now, marriage is treated as a sacred covenant that reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. That's how marriage is. It reflects the relationship, the way Christ and the church are synchronized together. is the same way the marriage that God has organized, covenant marriage, biblical marriage, is the same principle. The same way that Christ died for the church and preparing the church for his coming and is going to be the bridegroom of the church is the same principle in marriage. In other words, the marriage is a covenant that should be unbroken. Amen? So when you see people that are just misbehaving in marriage, you know, today say, I'm not doing it again, get out, you know, this and that, you know, they don't understand it. They don't understand it. Marriage is a covenant. It's treated as a sacred covenant that reflects the same relationship between Christ and the church. So in the Redeemed Christian Church of God, we teach that both partners must remain committed and faithful to each other for life. For life. Because we don't want anything called divorce. God hates divorce. Redeem hates divorce. And we too, we must hate divorce. So divorce is discouraged. Extremely discouraged. We don't want to hear about it. You know, except in extreme circumstances. And that's what we talk about adultery and all of those. But even with that, we still try to push reconciliation. Because you see, when you understand marriage as a covenant that reflects the way Jesus and the church goes together, you will discover that is there any sin that you are going to commit that Jesus will not forgive you if you repent? Let's be honest with ourselves. There is no sin. There is no sin. There is no sin that you are going to commit. If you kill a human being and you genuinely repent, Holy Spirit will maybe probably go take you through restitution. He will still forgive you. If there's nothing you will do, even when you blaspheme, you repent, He will still forgive you. So it's the same way God expects us. Even when one party commits adultery. It's painful, oh yes. You need time to heal, I agree. But is there room for forgiveness? 100%. 100%. In fact, it is better to reconcile than to separate. Because the separation on its own is so difficult. It is easier to reconcile than to separate. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Malachi chapter 2 verse 16. It tells us that God hates divorce. Ephesians 5 25. It tells us that husbands must love their wife just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So when we talk about marriage as a covenant, it's, you know, we're going to look at roles and responsibilities there. That's what I'm going to go to now. But it stands as two people understanding themselves and understanding what this covenant is about. You see, when we are in covenant with God Almighty, with Jesus, we understand it. There's no ambiguity. We know that Jesus is Lord and we are the branches, is the vine. And we know that without him, we can do nothing. So we accept it and we walk in that light. There's no confusion. You know, you're not going to tell Jesus that Jesus, I'm going to be your Lord. You are going to be my, 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 my branch. Say so for, for this year, because um, I've been praying and fasting so much. You know, I've won 100 souls. You know, I have opened 50 parishes. Therefore, I am not going to be the Lord. You are going to be the uh, branch. No. It is a principle that we accept. Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We are the branches. Without him, we can do nothing. So in a covenant, people understand their position and there is no quarrel, there is no fighting, there is no um, uh, uh, trivialization of your role. Everybody is important. Jesus is important. Jesus, we are important. He needs us and we need him. And the covenant is moving together. That is the same thing in marriage. Amen. And that will bring me to the roles of the uh, roles and responsibility in marriage. Now, for husbands, there's a role for the husband. There's also a role for the wife. 
If we can get this, you will have peace. There is no struggling. There is no struggling. And there is no amount of civilization that is going to change it. It's just like we cannot be so, 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 so spiritual and now say, oh, the, what Jesus said, that his Lord and Savior is seated in heavenly places and is seated by the right time of, of the Lord and God has given you a name, exalted above every other name, by a mention of his name, every day must bow. We say, no, 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 no. We have now understood that what we are doing on earth, we are winning so, so. Now, my name is going to be higher than Jesus' name. Therefore, Jesus, yes, your name is high. My name is also high. So when they mention my name, people must bow. All those are jargons. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the covenant is based on the principle. And until you follow it, you, you won't have problems. It's the same thing with marriage. So there is a role for the man and there's a role for the woman. It does not mean anybody is better or anybody is superior. Everybody needs each other. But everybody occupies a role so that it can work. Now, what is the role for the husband? Leadership in love, number one. Write it down. Leadership in love. Amen? The husband has a role of leadership in love. You know, a lot of husbands today, they are trying to enforce leadership, but they are not doing it in love. And that's where the problem comes from. It's leadership in love, not leadership in anger, not leadership in oppression, not leadership in violence, not leadership in hatred. It's leadership in what? Love. The husband is considered as the head of the family. <laughs> modeled after Christ's love for the church. Amen? Is expected and is mandated to love, to protect, to provide for, to lead his wife in such a way that honors God. Amen? Ephesians 5, 23. Amen? Uh, Deacon Estosin, please, you can also help us to project the scriptures. Thank you for what you are doing. I'm seeing it. Amen? God will bless you. Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of who? The wife. And it gives another dimension that people try to, you know, just ignore it. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Amen? So it's not that the husband is the head of the wife anyhow he likes. No, there's a condition. No? That condition is the same way as Christ is the head of the church. Now, let, if you want to know how to be a head, go and study the way Christ is the head of the church. You see, today, a lot of us, we have committed one sin. Some of us, we didn't fast. Today is fasting. Some didn't fast. Some fasted, they broke early. Some forgot. Some, they didn't open the uh, chat at all. They didn't even look at it. Some, they have even finished eating. If I say, hey, join our fasting. Hey, I don't spoil that. God understand. Amen. So what am I saying? Everybody has shortcomings here and there. Shortcomings, shortcomings, shortcomings. But in the midst of all these shortcomings, Jesus is still trying to embrace it because Jesus does not want anybody to perish. He came to save the lost. Will his blood be a waste on the cross? No. He came to save the lost. So he gives us more time, more time, more time. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I accept your apology. Come, 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 come. He keeps on embracing. That's why we say that his love is unconditional. It is that same way that the husband is going to be the head of the wife, giving the wife all those second chance, third chance, fourth chance, and, you know, trying to build her up in love. Now, the question for the men, do we do that? Or we just put instruction, I'm the head of this home, you must do like this, I don't want to know. In fact, if you don't do it, you are going to pack out. That's not how Jesus does it. If you say, oh, today you're not fast, therefore, tomorrow I'm going to leave you, the enemy will strike you. Who will be alive? We will not be here together. Amen? So we must have clarity of understanding. Leadership in love. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. You see, I'm stressing it because it has to sink. It has to sink for those of us who are married and for those who are going to get married. Again, in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, it says, husbands in the same way, be considerate, be considerate, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect. First Peter 3, 7, 
It's not by accident. It's because that is the same way Jesus has done it. If the, I remember when I became born again, I became born again, but I was still committing sin. In fact, I think I became born again like maybe 10 or 15 times. I can't remember. So I will give my life to God. I will commit sin. I will go back. I will come again until finally, if Jesus was not patient with me, I will not be your pastor today. It's not possible. It would, I would have been killed or destroyed by the enemy. But he knew that there's a plan for this boy. And there's a future for him. So I must be patient with him and allow him bringing the word of God through different means so that by any chance, he will accept it. And here am I today. Amen? So that is the way Jesus is. That's the way husbands are to be. You must be considerate with your wife and treat them with respect, trying to mold them and let them become who God has created them to be. Praise the name of the Lord. So that's enough for the men because of time. Let's go to the women, the wives. Now, what is the role and responsibility of the wife? Amen. You see, the role and responsibility of the husband, we've looked at it, is love. Leadership in love. What's the one for the woman? Submission in love. The same love again. Amen. Submission in what? In love. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. The wife is called to submit to the husband as the church submits to Christ. So if you want to look at it in the covenant of marriage, in comparing it with the covenant of the relationship with Christ and the church, the way Christ is the head of the church, that's how the men are head. The way the church submits to Jesus and is Jesus that is responsible for the church trying to make sure the church without uh, spots and blemish and all of that, is the church here is the same way that the wife is. The wife is to submit to the husband as the church submits to Christ. However, the submission is balanced by the husband's responsibility to love and care for his wife sacrificially. Amen. So you see, marriage is not... Is not um, rocket science and it's not something that you do in your own culture or the way you like it must follow biblical principles that's how it works so the woman must submit to the husband like the way christ submits is the way the church submits to christ that's how the woman will submit and she must submit in all things all all things you must submit in everything amen you are to submit in everything and this submission, the man too is also going to be responsible to love and care. So you see, it is a two-way thing. You see, because Jesus loves us, because he died for us, because he has proven his unconditional love for us, it is easier for you and I to follow Christ because we know Christ has our best interests at heart. There's no doubt. We know that God loves us and he has our interest at heart. So because of what God has done, what Jesus continues to do on a daily basis, it is easy for us to follow Jesus. It's easy for us. You see, so when the husband is loving his wife, the husband is providing, the husband is protecting, the husband is leading, it's very easy for the woman to submit to the husband. If your husband is giving you all those things, loving you, doing all those things, it's easy. But when those love is lacking, when all those leadership is lacking, it is difficult for the woman to submit. And that's why we say the two people must work at it. So marriage is not about, oh, my wife does not submit. She's very, pastor, you don't know this woman. She's very useless. She doesn't submit. She's stubborn. She's this. She's that. The question is, you the man, are you leading in love? Or you say, oh, look, there's no way I'm going to uh, submit to my husband. You know, my, I can, my, my, my husband is, is reckless, is this, and therefore I cannot submit. So it's a two-way thing. The man must first of all love because it's the man that is living to go and take the Bible is not, is not, there's no mistake in the Bible. The man is the one leaving his house.
to go and marry the woman. It's not the woman coming from his house to come and join. You live and you go and cleave. So you are the one coming. So when you are coming, it's just like us. It's Jesus that is coming to us. He left heaven and came to earth. He was comfortable as God. But he chose to become a man. Chose Mary and you know, became, he came as human flesh. Came to the world. Showed us how to live. Died for us so that we can come. So he came to us. Amen. That's how the man, everything is the same. The man will live and go to the woman. He, the man goes to the woman the way Christ came to us. Then when the man comes, the way Christ is showing his love is through his love, his love, his love that makes us to repent. So the man must show the love too, leading, you know, providing, protecting. Then the woman will submit. So this is how it is meant to be. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. If, it's, if you follow this way, you wait. Nobody. We have been married for 20 years by the grace of God. Amen. No, 19 years. By next year, it's going to be 20. And we have never gone for any counseling concerning my wife. Oh, my wife did this. Or my wife went somewhere. Oh, report me to somebody. Nobody. In fact, I remember my in laws were like about, I think, about five or six years in marriage then. And they had. There was somebody else, you know, in the family that they were always fighting. In fact, today they are separated. They are divorced. You know, they have a daughter and a son. So the man has a son outside, but they, they have a daughter together as husband and wife. They are separated now. You know, the, the man, I think the man has gone to America. The woman is left in Nigeria and all of that. So the, the head of the family said, come, you people have been married for over 20 something years. As at that time, that this boy, you know, he called my wife, this Judith and the husband that they are married for just a few years. They have never one day come here to come and set any quarry. That this old couple, they should come and look at the way we are married and follow the way what we are doing. I remember it very vividly. And it was like very embarrassing to them. But what the man was trying to say is that, look, these people have never one day come up with any issue of disagreement or quarrel or misunderstanding. Why is it so? Because we were privileged to hear the word of God. We were privileged to be counseled. I was counseled in Portacot. There in Portacot, what they do is that whether you have a spouse or not, or sorry, um, a, um, what they call it now, a fiancé, you, whether you have found somebody you want to marry or not, once they look at you, say, do you want to get married? Are you hoping to get married? Say yes. Oh yeah, you go and join the counseling. The counseling was an area program. So all the parishes in that area, they will gather together on a Saturday. We had it once every month, or I think, yeah, once. And everybody will come there. In the midst of that counseling program, some people, they connected to each other and they got married. So that, it was a serious counseling with a lot of us coming with all, me. I, I remember then I was always having questions. I was disagreeing because I was a very young Christian. So I was disagreeing with a lot of things. I was using my culture. I'm from a royal family. You know, we are kings. We do what we like. So I was fighting the status quo. So they were always showing me scriptures, scriptures. And I was subdued in that counseling. In fact, halfway through the counseling, they made me a coordinator. Say, you, the interest you are showing, you must be a coordinator. So I was a coordinator for my own parish. And in fact, that is from that counseling, I became a worker. So the, I became known. And because I was very vocal, I was very forceful. I was not agreeing with the principles. Amen. A lot of people, they go into marriage not agreeing with biblical principles. And that is what causes a problem. So I was privileged. So I knew all of that. My wife came from a very godly family. She had, they were taught her everything. So those two people knowing everything. In fact, we don't even have anybody. There's nothing to teach us. We already know. Amen. So then we began to understand ourselves because we followed this covenant. If you follow it the way I've said it, thank God it's on Facebook and we can always watch the video. Amen. If you follow it, you will never have any problem. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. I think we'll try to finish in the next 10 to 15 minutes. God helping us. Now, there's also what you know we're talking about the responsibility now. There's also a mutual responsibility that both spouses are expected to nurture, both spouses are expected to encourage, and both the man and the woman 
are expected to respect each other. These three things are mutual. You know, the, the man has a specific role, leadership in love. The woman has a specific role, submission in love. But two of them together, they also have a mutual role, which is I must do it, my wife must do it. Okay? Which is they must nurture each other. Okay? Now, in, when you go, when we do marriage counseling, we tell you that you are not to compete, you are to complement. In other words, the strength of A will be put into B. Some women, it's on marriages, the woman is stronger. Let's take, for example, just can you picture the marriage of somebody like Professor Konjo Iwala with the husband? The woman is stronger. She has more influence. Of course, she's going to be more wealthier. She has a clout. She's an international figure. But I just imagine now, you get, she gets married to a man that does not have understanding. Oh, my wife must not be this one. We must sit down here. At the end of the day, the whole family will suffer for it. But because she's married to a man that has understanding, the man is even behind her, pushing her forward, pushing her, go, I'll follow you, I will support you, I will support you. And that's why she's excelling. So your wife might be stronger than you financially. That means that you will not show that her financial strength for the benefit of you, herself, and the family. So there is a mutual responsibility for two of you to nurture. The strength of each other, nurture it. Then, where this person is weak, the other person will cover. That's what it means. You complement each other. And you must also, you must also, uh, you must encourage each other. Encourage each other with the word of God. Okay? Let the word of God be your driving force. You know why? Because everything, I remember somebody posted something on our, on our social chat yesterday. And I was saying that we must be careful. Because people have a lot of stories. Oh, I was this, I was that. If you follow what they are doing, it's possible. I'm not saying it must. It's possible that you can make the same mistake. But if you follow the principle of the word of God, mistakes are avoided. Amen? It's when we go out. The moment if foolishly went to the tree and was listening to Satan, that's when she was. She had the opportunity to be tempted. If she has seen Satan, Satan said, come, say, get out. I'm not meant to be talking to you. There is no way she would have heard anything that she would start thinking about. Amen? So you must make sure that you encourage each other with the word of God. Not with what happened in pastor of his marriage. Not in what your father did that you saw. If it's something that is, that is good, biblical, of course, we can copy. But what am I saying? Let us use the word of God as our guiding principles. You know why? You will not be exposed to mistakes. So you must encourage each other with the word of God. And even if you are going to go to counseling with anybody, if the person is not using the word of God, I'm telling you, my brother, my sister, my son and daughter, I run away. Because this world as it is right now is full of corrupt things. They are corrupting anything that can be corrupted. So you must run away. Amen? Then, another mutual responsibility for two of you, husband and wife, is respect for each other. You must respect your wife. The same way your wife will respect you. Thank God for the culture that we have. In our, all our cultures in Nigeria, all the cultures, the woman is primed to respect her husband. So when we talk about respect, I'm really going to address the men more. Don't belittle your wife. Don't look down your wife. Don't talk to her anyhow. Don't think that she doesn't matter. She does matter. She does matter. Amen? You must respect your wife. Don't embarrass your wife in public. Don't look down. Don't talk down on your wife. Like what you saw our former president doing. Or saying, oh, uh, <laughs> what's the woman saying? Uh, I don't know what my wife is saying. She belongs to the kitchen and to the other room. And you know, the irony of that, the whole event was that he was talking to a female president. And even the president that he was talking to was even stronger than himself. He went there to go and beg for, you know, support and aid. Amen. So you can see the irony. Respect your wife. Men, respect your wife. Respect your wife. Respect your wife. And you will see a very, very different side. Blessing. You know, there are so many blessings that come from a woman. When you read Proverbs 31, you will see a lot of things. Amen. When you respect the women. You will see that all of those things will be coming alive. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So I'm going to move quickly. Amen. Let's see if we can talk about two more things. 
There's one other thing that's very, very crucial when we talk about marriage. That is communication. Amen? There's no way we can talk about marriage that won't talk about communication. So what is the importance of communication? You know, the redeemed Christian Church of God places strong emphasis on good communication in marriage. Couples are encouraged to be open. We are encouraged to be honest and respectful in our conversations, fostering an environment where issues can be addressed in love and in wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 19, James 1, 19. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Amen? So we must have open communication. Don't be keeping things and assuming, oh, my wife knows, no, my husband knows that. I know. No, 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 discuss it. Talk about it. You see, your best friend is your spouse. Your companion is your spouse. Your counselor is your spouse. Your, com how do they call it, confidence, I mean, confidence is your spouse. Amen? The person that you will share information with that you are secure with is your spouse. You must let you, if your spouse is not all of these things, you have to create your spouse to become just thing. And what I mean spouse, that's your husband to the wife and the wife to the husband. Amen? They must share conversation, secrecy, you know, openness, honesty. Tell your wife the truth. Tell her. Amen? Some people, they don't, some wives don't know how much their husband is earning. They have no idea. Some husbands don't know that their wife what they are earning. Some women have gone to build houses behind the back of their husband. You ask some sex now, who are they building the house for? You know, all of this is all a, when there's open communication, when there's honesty and respect in conversations, fostering an environment of love and wisdom, all of these things will not be there. So in, in communication is very important. Praise the name of the Lord. Again, I will talk about sexual purity and fidelity in marriage. Now, when we talk about marriage, one of the paramount things that stands as a blessing in marriage is sex. Amen? Everybody, every human being, once you get to sexual age, your body is desiring sexual intercourse. And the Bible tells us that it is only in the confines of marriage that you are free to do it. You are, you are licensed. If you want to be doing it three times a day, so be it. If you want to be doing it twice a week, so be it. You see, sexual purity and fidelity in marriage is very important. And the couple, husband and wife, must agree how they want to do it. There are so many marriages that have broken down because of sex. The woman does not allow the man to have the amount of sex that he wants. The man does not consider the woman's strength, you know, there's, there must be a agreement and there must be a harmonization in the area of sex. It's very important. And people don't want to discuss it. I remember there was a marriage counseling I attended right here in the UK and we're talking about a lot of things. When it came to sex, they wanted to jump it. I brought everybody back. I said, Pastor, talk about it. What are you, is, what, what are you running away from? What are you running away from? People to be, behave as if when we talk about sex, we're talking about sin. No, it's not sin. It is what God has given to husband and wife to enjoy. So it must be addressed. It must be talked about. It must be brought to the limelight. And misunderstanding, misconception must be addressed. So that people we know, when we go for marriage counseling, when it's sex, when that topic of sex, they will just do rah, 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 run away. What are you running away from? That thing you are running away from is coming in front. So a lot of people have misconceptions about sex in marriage. Sex is a gift from God, meant to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage. Marital uh, uh, faithfulness is emphasized, and adultery is condemned. We don't want to hear anything about adultery. So if there's not going to be anything about adultery, where is the man and woman going to have sex? It's in marriage. So there must be mutual cooperation, understanding. There must be support. You know, there must be plan. You can plan your sex rota. You can make a roster. Say, oh, it's every Tuesday or it's every other day. Not anyhow you want to do it, but be satisfied with sex with your husband and your wife. Because you see, 
when you have enough sex with husband and wife, there is no temptation. By the time somebody else is coming, you are even tired. You don't even have time. You have had enough. It's like somebody that went to a party, for example, and they brought Amala and Bigri, Pandedam and Okro, uh, um, uh, uh, Eba and Egusi, rice and stew, Ofada, everything in your front. You eat this, eat this, you are, you eat and you are satisfied. They're on your way. Somebody now comes and say, oh, there's one yogurt and one bread and ice cream. Take, you, you will look at it, even if it's enticing. Oh, this thing looks yummy. What will you do? You'll be holding your stomach. Ah, I don't belly full. Ah, I'm not going to feed your Oh, maybe next time. So you see, the enticement is easier to overcome because you are already overfed. But let that situation be with a hungry man that has not eaten since yesterday. And somebody bring, before I even bring the yogurt and the ice cream and the bread, the person's mouth has opened and eats everything up because he's already hungry. So it's the same thing. When you are fully sexually satisfied in your marriage, try that somebody's coming with half skirts, somebody's opening six packs and 20 packs, hair on the chest, all those things, it will be difficult, you know? It's not as if you will not be attractive because, you know, the, the, the uh, loss of the eyes is there and all those things, but it is easier to overcome. It's easier. Many pastors and, and children of God that fell into sexual immorality, adultery, if you go and check it, most of the time, it's either their wife is depriving them or their husband is not satisfying them. So there is something pushing them. Let me just, ah, let me just, and before you know it, they fall. Amen. Hebrews 13 verse 4. Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all. And marriage, uh, and the marriage bed kept pure, undefined. For God will judge the adulterer and all sexual immorals. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So we must have sexual purity and enjoy sex in marriage. Now, the husband and the wife must cooperate. Sometimes the women are really tired, but sometimes the women are corny too and say they have a headache, meanwhile they don't have any headache. Amen? Probably the man has done something to them, you want to use that one to pay back. All of those is not advisable. You know, there are so many things, but time will not allow us to talk about them. But sex must be co-op, it must be a cooperation for sex in marriage. Then the last thing I will talk about as I begin to round up, or probably maybe I will I just have a few more things, but I'll just rush this one down. Number seven is prayer and spiritual growth together. Amen. One of the advantages of marriage is that you have a prayer partner. Do you know that if you pray with your wife in agreement, it's the, the in fact, when the Bible says two, which is 10,000, husband and wife is a classical example of two chasing 10,000 rather than one chasing a thousand. So when two of you come together in prayer, you are going to chase 10,000. In other words, it is 10, is that what they call it? Is it, is it 100% or how many percent, you know, effectiveness in prayer? So couples must pray together, study the Bible together, attend church regularly, amen, to grow spiritually and also to strengthen your marriage because everything about marriage is derived from the scripture. Marriage is all scriptural. So the more spiritual uh, unity you put together, coming together in the place of prayer, the more strengthened and successful your marriage will be. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. There is also raising godly children. When God blesses you with children, Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. Amen? We must raise our children with the fear and the knowledge of God. Good uh, parenting. Godly parenting. Parents are expected to be role models, models like Christ, Christ-like behavior, so that the children can see the scripture in reality. Amen? We are the practicality of the Bible to them, so they can see it. Not you are lying and you are telling your child something else, or you are saying your child, go and tell her I've traveled, and you are there. All of those things, you are imbibing the spirit of lies and deceit into the child. So we must raise our children in godly manner so that they will grow up as children of God. You see, most of us that 
were trained or people, I was not trained in a biblical way. Luckily for me, by the time I became wise, you know, I was um, exposed to live with two pastors. And probably that's what shaped me. Then I was still rejecting Christ. I didn't want to submit myself to the, uh, to the calling of salvation. But by the time I submitted, I had so many examples to look, to emulate. Amen? So we are to be examples for our children, godly children. And when they grow up, they will not depart from it. And that will be the testimony in the name of Jesus. Now, there's an issue of conflict resolution. Because if I tell you that there's no conflict in marriage, I will not have told you the absolute truth. There are misunderstandings. There are different views. There are different opinions. And these opinions, when they are not properly handled, it leads to conflict. So what am I saying here? A marriage where there's conflict, it should be resolved through prayer, through love, forgiveness, and biblical principles. If you employ all of this, you won't have a problem. You won't have a problem. Amen? True prayer, true love, forgiveness, and biblical principles. That's how you resolve your conflict in marriage. When all of this is put in place, you will discover that you will never come to a pastor to report any issue. Pastor, I want you to come and talk to my husband. Or pastor, my wife, you know, I cannot cope anymore. Because on your own, you are already using biblical principles. So the Bible is your watchword. The Bible is your guide. You are ready to forgive because one person may err. You are ready to forgive. And because love covers a multitude of misunderstanding, love is not puffed up. You know, read 1 Corinthians, I think it's 13. Read everything about love. You will see what love is. Love is not puffed up. It's not envious. It does not uh, the glory in strife. Nothing. So love itself will cover a multitude of sin a multitude of conflict, a multitude of misunderstanding, and there's forgiveness. Then you now begin to use biblical principles to resolve issues. You will find out that everything will be easy. That is where we say that you must avoid bitterness and pursue reconciliation quickly so that your marriage will not go into flames. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Amen? And do not give the devil a foothold. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Now, maybe we can just talk about one more, avoiding unequally yoked relationship. Praise the Lord. Now, in the redeemed Christian church of God, we strongly advise against marrying someone who does not share in the Christian faith. I should have mentioned this in when we're talking about courtship, but I think I skipped it. So I just want to put it before we conclude tonight. We must make sure you marry someone that has the same Christian faith with you. Don't go and be saying, I've waited for so long, I cannot wait anymore. Especially for our sisters. Don't go and marry somebody that is of a different faith, a different belief, that have a different idea, not the same vision. Because the principles will be different. But if you marry a Christian, a believer, even if it's from another de de denomination, it doesn't matter. You're mar I'm marrying somebody from Winners, from Deeper Life, from Christ Embassy, as Bible believing. No, it's fine. It's fine. Amen? You will find out that your visions align. The principles you're going to use is going to be the same because we all use the Bible. Amen? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Second Corinthians 6 verse 14. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So in summary tonight, amen, emphasis is a, 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 the, the importance of faith, of prayer, and holiness. Amen. Courtship, like we started from, is intended for a period before marriage. Amen. Where we are guided towards the will of God and spiritual accountability. Marriage, on the other hand, it's a long life, long life, long life, long life. You see, I'm emphasizing it. Long life covenant between a man and a woman. Reflecting the relationship between Christ and the church with key values such as love, mutual respect, purity, faithfulness, spiritual good. And it's essential so that they can build a God-fearing marriage and their destinies can be fulfilled 
together. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So I don't know, probably we have questions or anything. If you put it in the next five minutes, and we can, I can attempt to answer them. Amen. If we have anything, probably you want to put it on the comments. I'm seeing all the comments. I can easily answer those questions. Or probably if uh, maybe if we cannot do that, we can take all those things to our chat group on our Praise the Banakul, um social chats, and we can be discussing it there. If there are any questions or comments or somebody wants to say something, or you have a question, we can look at it quickly before we wrap up tonight. So for one minute, I'm just waiting. I'm going through the chat. I can see everything. If there are questions, anybody typing anything, probably they have questions or they are not agreeing with something. Amen. We can quickly discuss that before we take our prayers. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, I don't see anything coming in, so I don't want to keep you any further. Um, I thank God for this opportunity that God has given us to discuss a topic such as this in a time like this. And I pray that all that we have heard today will be hearers and doers. It will shape in us. Those that are tending to get married can have more ideas. And of course, the church is open to counseling. Amen. We have counseling programs. Anybody who wants to get do counseling, come up and we'll take you through. Amen. Three months thereabouts, we would have finished all that we need to do and get you ready for marriage. Those that have issues in their marriage, apply these principles. You need a bit of guide. You need more details. Reach out to me and we'll, I'll be gladly provide all the information that you need. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for a wonderful time in your presence tonight. Thank you, O oh God, for what you have done in our midst tonight. Thank you for this House Fellowship Week that has commenced. Thank you for day two. Thank you, O oh God, for all that you have taught us tonight. We are praying that you will release a new dimension of faithfulness, of love, of respect, of mutual understanding, of spiritual growth, of purity, of, res of, of mutual respect in all our marriages, even those who are going to marry in the future. Father, let all of this be imbibed in the name of Jesus. Your covenant and your ability, your desire for marriages, let it be made manifest in all our homes in the name of Jesus. We pray, my Father, my God, that you will introduce new wine of joy, of peace, of love, of respect, of abundance, of, of greatness in all our marriages, in all our homes, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that marriages will be fruitful, we will have children, our children will not be vagabonds, they will not be wayward, they will be glorious, they will be full of greatness. They will have potentials for ability in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that every marriage will be blessed. We are blessed with spiritual blessing, material blessing, physical blessing, even with fruit of the womb in the mighty name of Jesus. All those who are trusting you for marriage, Father, this season, because of what you are doing in this week-long program, Lord, open the door. Let their partners begin to come from far and near. Let there be a divine connection so that you will move them from being single to become married in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord God, that this week we'll have testimonies. Testimonies of your power, of your wonders, of your greatness in the name of Jesus. As your world is flowing like a river, Father, there will be transformation from sorrow to joy, from failure to success, from limitation to, 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 to promotion, from stagnancy to abundance in the name of Jesus. There will be a move, a shift from ignorance to wisdom in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, every one of us will show forth your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. I cover every one of us in the blood of Jesus and I lift up praise tabernacle into your hands. Lord, the church will march on. We shall be unstoppable and we'll move from glory to glory. For everyone, from the pastorate to the ministers, to the workers, the volunteers, the members, everyone shall be blessed in the name of Jesus. And so shall it be. In the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, in the name of God the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you. We, we lift up our hands and say, glory be to your holy name. Take of the glory in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the mighty name of the Lord. So please, 
The program continues on the next one is on Thursday, Faith Clinic. Please let's be available. Friday, we have our Mount Zion Vigil, amen, with Pastor Simeon, Ade, and Jew. Then on Saturday, we're going to be having all our conferences, our workshop. Then we'll finish on Sunday. So it's a week of glorious impartation. And I declare that every one of us would not remain the same way, would have moved to a higher level, both spiritually, both financially, materially, emotionally. Amen? In the name of Jesus. Long things that have been problems in our lives, they shall all be broken this week in the mighty name of Jesus. And so shall it be in Jesus' mighty name we pray. We also want to use this medium to appreciate the House Fellowship leadership for this program that they've put together. And I pray that they will be the first partakers of the reward therein in the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you all. Have a very good night and good evening. And stay strong and know that you shall experience the wonders of God even in this month of October in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you all. Shalom. <laughs>